begin as I always begin in the name of Allah, whose grace I seek in this and all other matters. Islamic feminist exegesis of the Quran was a precursor to the rise of Islamic feminism as methodology and movement. When I published my PhD dissertation under the name Quran and Woman in 1992, there was no such thing as Islamic feminism. Instead, one had to choose between feminisms that were overwhelmingly hostile to religion, especially Islam, and the dominant interpretation of Islam that was overwhelmingly patriarchal. Therefore, the most common mantra was, you cannot have feminism and Islam. There are some who think this is still the case. However, a vibrant and intersectional movement has taken place to challenge the dominant rubrics of both feminism and Islam as they entered the new millennium. The publication of Quran and Woman, initially with an Oxford University Press subsidiary in Malaysia, did not lead to a revolution. However, as it was being edited for publication, I entered a new phase of my life trajectory, which would impact my interpretive work. As one of eight founding members to a grassroots women's organization called Sisters in Islam, SIS, I would enter feminist activism for social justice from within a faith perspective. This activism changed my approach to textual hermeneutics. As a PhD student, it was easy to lo my, locate my individual self as a Muslim woman within my exegesis, but I had no concept of how to uh, relate it to Muslim women's lived realities in the context of law, policy, and culture. For one thing, there is no personal status law in the US there are ad hoc legal postulates in certain Muslim communities, which are overwhelmingly patriarchal. However, these are not the law of the land and thus lack state enforcement. Working with CIS for that first three years, I saw the important nexus between theory and praxis, leading me to promote the notion of context over text. The context of lived realities for Muslim women especially those realities, when those are, are realities are used in codification of public policy, would soon come to eclipse the text whenever it was used to enforce patriarchal hegemony. In this presentation, I will discuss the importance of lived realities to the hermeneutics of the Quran. This led to new knowledge production and an expansion of authority beyond the dominant male model of control that had gone on for nearly 14 centuries. In turn, this led me to Islamic feminism. As the Islamic feminist movement began to unfold, my approach to hermeneutics would be transformed. While Islamic feminism could be said to be part of Islamic reform in the new millennium, it has taken a more comprehensive and truly global step, more so than any other aspect of Islamic reform. Indeed, any aspect of reform that does not engage the gender dynamic is already outdated and incomplete. The journey towards Islamic feminist knowledge production creates a coherent methodology of using gender as a category of interrogation for all Islamic primary sources and for their application in the law and culture. It dismantled more than 1,000 years of patriarchal control over textual exegesis and Muslim lives. While Islamic feminism centers on the lived realities of Muslim women, it is not just about women. It is about moving the understanding of gender from hegemony and control to equality and reciprocity. My first book, Quran and Woman, is deeply intuitive, critically analytical, and explicitly gender inclusive. It enhanced the field of Quranic exegesis by confirming not only that Muslim women speak, but also by providing evidence that when we speak, we do so from our own realities. Furthermore, it gave evidence that men had been speaking from their own their realities for centuries, but calling it universal. As Muslim women speak, we say some things differently from what men have said for over a millennium. Although Islamic feminist exegesis is more than just women, 
It included women's realities in Quranic analysis in such a way that it challenges the dominant and prolific model of centering analysis of sacred texts and religious practice around men and men's experiences as if universal. By centering women's voices and experiences in the way the primary texts were understood and adjudicated, the whole rubric of patriarchal hegemony was upset. Islamic feminism takes into consideration the epistemology of textual analysis by constructing gender as a category of thought. Classical Islamic intellectual traditions that operated within a well entrenched patriarchal model took it for granted that men were the ideal agents and that they were superior to women as a matter of cosmology, theology, epistemology, and praxis. Men were in charge and women were here to support men's movement towards the divine. To be sure, Islamic classical thought expressed the general understanding promoted in the Quran and by the prophet upon him be peace, that women are fully human. Simultaneously, patriarchal interpretation subtracted from women's full humanity at almost every turn. Patriarchy is not the subject of my discussion here, but as the elephant in the room, I will indicate how I understand it in order to show why it is not the focus. To focus on patriarchy distracts from the tasks I have taken up over a lifetime and once again centers men, men's ways of knowing, being, and doing. Patriarchy privileges men, patriarchy gives privilege to men over centuries of humanity's movement to manifest its highest potential. Patriarchy is constructed around an inherent inequality of human relationships. It was encoded first by action and social structure, then justified by Hellenistic philosophy. Each person has a place in society. Some places are higher than other places. Some are even placed as slaves to serve others who are placed as masters. The presumption that a slave is equal to a master in any way was not only unfathomable, its absence was justification for the institution of slavery. Patriarchal is not just a gender construct. However, in application to gender, it mandates a hegemony based on privileging men over women. In the Islamic cosmology of human design, we all descend from a single soul, self or being, nefs. Nefs is feminine grammatically, but is used for the essence of the sentient being, whether male, female, or non-binary. It has been translated as soul or self, although there are other words for soul in Arabic as well. Since the word nefs is also used in the Quran for the creator, who is not a being at all, it should not be seen as a substitute for human, except in the way the creation story is told. All of humankind descends from a single soul, nefsin wahida. The Quran does not state that the human sojourn on the earth starts with a male person or even the nefs of a male person. It is taken for granted that the first human was Adam, just as it is taken for granted that Adam was a male person. However, even prior to this human creation, the Quran assures us in the words of God from all things, we have created pairs. Thus male and female are e equally essential to this ontological design. Every created thing participates in this binary at some level. Quranic cosmology does not include an original sin, which was then assigned as the fault of woman. The language of Quranic cosmology uses the unique Arabic dual form and is therefore inclusive. The two ate of the fruit, the two disobeyed Allah, the two sinned. However, the only scriptural exegesis at the time of the revelation of the Quran came from Christian and Jewish thinkers whose hegemonic encoding of the first human as male and the first sinner as female were applied to Quranic analysis throughout the centuries. This asymmetrical gendered reading was taken for granted by scholars and laypersons for centuries. The first time I received a letter threatening my death was after a public lecture in which I debunked the rib story and it was written up in an article in one of the main newspapers. 
we have no rib story in the Quran. Still, the prevailing idea amongst Muslims is that a man was put to sleep and a woman was extracted from under his heart. Nevertheless, a strict Quranic reading does not support this reduction. I mention this because it exemplifies how rereading the text from a gender perspective challenges certain entrenched ideas and leads to the production of new knowledge. The significance of knowledge production when related to a religious ethos that includes revealed texts cannot be overstated. Most members of the Muslim community expect only to receive religious knowledge that descends from a sacred and unknowable source. Eventually, an elite class of interpreters were elevated to nearly a level of infallibility, despite strict rules against such throughout, of, throughout all of Muslim intellectual history. The most vexing part of this elitism was that even when women's scholarship was an integral part, was integral, even mandatory part of the Islamic traditions, women did not play a substantial role in setting the operating paradigms of Islamic thought. Eventually, women's subjective knowledge was deemed incongruent with truth or orthodoxy, while men apparently had no subjectivity. With Islamic feminist reform, all interpretations are returned to the status of mere human struggling to understand and implement divine mandates. You cannot imagine how hard it is to disengage men's subjectivity from the copious and even erudite and eloquent constructions of Islamic thought. The moment women seek authority through knowledge production, they can suffer challenges to their full humanity by being classified as disbelievers, heretics, and even enemies to Islam. Notice how often Muslim women attach the word believer or practicing to themselves and their intellectual production or activism. To engage in textual analysis from a male perspective is sacrosanct and scholarly. To engage in textual analysis from a female perspective is heretical, even evil. Male and female are not closed categories. All that is masculine is not male, and all that is feminine is not female. All that is male is not masculine, and all that is female is not feminine. Rather, female and male form a spectrum between two points in a binary abstract possibility. I identify as non-Barrett binary because I see how my feminine aspects operate in a constant dynamic relationship with my masculine aspects. Within the spectrum of possibilities, reality is neither exclusive nor absolute. All humans fall along this binary spectrum with both masculine and feminine attributes, aspects, and essences. Gender is a construct. During the foundational discourse of Islamic thought, men dominated discussion and encoded their own humanity as total or comparable for both women and men. Men became the measure of what it means to be human. To achieve excellence as human was often constructed as belonging exclusively to men, yet even then, not all men. Men who were servants, travelers, indigent, not the same ethnicity, color, race, religion, sexual expression were, like all women, also considered deficient in their humanity. According to Hellenistic philosophy, this was good and just. The differences between the male and the female were presumed to operate within a necessary hegemony within differential treatment and analysis as natural and necessary. If any two beings came together, one must be better than the other. Therefore, men were better. The logic of hegemony is patriarchy. I advocated a move beyond this flawed hegemonic conception towards one of reciprocity and horizontal equality using the most fundamental principle of Islam monotheism, Tawheed. And I'm gonna elaborate on this a little bit below. It was through textual analysis from a gender perspective of Quranic or Islamic cosmology that I composed a new epistemology of gender equality starting with the human purpose or teleology. The Quran states, I will make on the earth an agent in me ja'ilun fil ardi khalifa. A khalifa means moral agent. This is how we know there is no original sin that caused a fall to earth. Earth was always the goal and the place where human agents fulfill their purpose. 
as agents on the earth, establishing justice is mandatory. However, as Islamic feminist ethics has unpacked, there were many ways in which agency was given completely to some men and only partially to women. Women's agency was best articulated as a completion of men's agency. Otherwise, women were often considered a primary deterrent to men's fulfilling their agency. Um, and here I like to cite just quickly some work by some other Islamic feminist colleagues, including uh, Zahra Ayyubi's book on gender morality that engages a critical gender reading of philosophy in order to show once again that the full moral being was presumed to be male. Another is the uh, Sufi analysis by uh, Saadia Sheikh in a book called Sufi Narratives of Intimacy where she cites a notable exception to the tendency to reinscribe male superiority in the person of Ibn al-Arabi. Uh, nevertheless, he was unique and he was also uh, in some ways a bit rare and obscurantist. The existence of a few small voices did not change the formula that became tantamount to sacred mandates across time and place. Still today, the active inclusion of women's realities is undervalued in the estimation of the human sojourn from the perspective of male scholars. And here I cite uh, Keisha Ali's work on the lack of uh, referencing being made by male scholars of Islam uh, to women, even if they're talking about the subject of gender. Thus the measurement of one's humanity, ethics and agency are based upon an idealized location of men. Women can never measure up against this because they are their own measurement. Such a perception did not exist. Such analysis would take long before it would be promoted. As we left the 20th century, scholarship and activism have taken a radical paradigm shift. Women's agency, creativity, spirituality, and scholarship are part of the landscape, despite pockets of opposition. In almost 50 years of Quranic analysis, while I was never interested in becoming a man, I was nonetheless interested in equality. So my dissertation, which was focused on the absence of sex role stereotyping in the Quran, makes a reading in such a way that it stands in juxtaposition to male and female scholars and activists who take certain Quranic statements that repeat the gender hegemony prevailing at the time of the Quran as the core of the Quran over Quranic statements that participate in reciprocity at the highest level. The Quran is not only descriptive, it is prescriptive. In the Quranic epistemology and worldview, the rhetoric of othering is absent. So while I have addressed all of the hegemonic statements in my scholarship and activism, I have never taken them as standard. The bigger question remained, what measures need to be taken to establish this construction of gender equality? To answer this question, a wedding of Islamic theology with lived realities of Muslim women was necessary. So let me just say a little bit about the theology before I talk about the lived realities. Uh, based on uh, a reading of a recurrent theme within Islamic theology, uh, metaphysics, uh, spirituality and ethics, um, I noticed that there was a tendency to construct a notion of a relationship with humans from God to male to female on this vertical line. And I found it problematic because in that model where there was a direct relationship between you know, God and the male, there was not a direct relationship between God and the female, and yet that is fundamental. There's no intermediary between Allah uh, and any person in accordance to Islamic strict theology. So I constructed my own model, which is more a triangle. And while it keeps God at the highest focal point, keep in mind that God is not limited to any one position, but this is just a graphic. It keeps uh, God at the highest uh, location but it puts male and female on a horizontal line of reciprocity. So in fact, if you believe in the one God or in Tawheed, then your personhood, your actions, and uh, your theology should be based on only a relationship of horizontal reciprocity with an other. 
Um, I started this with gender. I've made it an application to um, matters of uh, sexuality, to religion, to race, to nationality, et cetera. In other words, using that fundamental principle uh, in a way that each person has access to a law means therefore that each person fulfills what Martin Buber talked about in his I thou formulas of um, ethical um, equality and reciprocity. So this new model tackled the pervasive patriarchal thinking with men on top, superior to or in charge of women and non elite others. I call it the Tawhidic paradigm because it's built upon the indisputable and fundamental theological principle of Tawhid, which means that Allah is one and unique, but comes from the second form of the verb and therefore is dynamic. Allah unites. So all who claim to believe in Tawhid and wish to live and surrender to Allah, which is another word for Islam, must operate in such a way that the divine reality of one is ex expressed in all human to human relationships only with reciprocity and equality. Despite this Tawhidic theological framework, uh, there is a pervasive logic of hegemony um, and the source of that might be taken from the Quranic story of uh, Iblis or Satan, who refused to obey the command to bow to the first human by saying, I am better than he, istikbar. So istikbar, the thinking of oneself as better than another, is the uh, foundation for all forms of inequality, but also for oppression. And the Quran is emphatic that Allah does not oppress. So Quranic language, syntax, and metaphor is absent in the rhetoric of hegemonic juxtaposition on the basis of the diverse characteristics of human to human diversity. In the Quran, the only qualification of preference is based on two things, faith and good deeds. The highest ethical term in the Quran is taqwa. And taqwa is both the moral consciousness that results from awareness of divine consequence and the ethical actions that result from compassion that this consciousness would lead to. And the Quran is explicit. The most noble of you in the sight of Allah is the one with the most taqwa. So while the Quran does not make note of characteristics of persons placed situational in elevation over others, these are descriptive passages. The Quran is both descriptive and prescriptive. Other features of feminist exegesis limits descriptive passages to particular paths while encoding prescriptive passages into their universal benefit across time. Rhetorical hegemony accounts for a manifest I, it social construct through satanic consciousness or logic. The last thing that I want to share is um, the understanding of live reality as a rubric of analysis. This is based on the heaviest uh, concentration of Islamic scholarship in the area of law or policy. Um, I don't want to go into you know, all the details, but the understanding of the divine way, with the divine way being sharia uh, or fiqh, is Jewish prudence. This is what has been encoded in the law and feminist exegesis uh, and uh, feminist activism has shown that this is um, the way in which certain patriarchal rubrics become encoded um, in state law um, and then they're taken as if they are divine and are therefore equivalent to Sharia. So distinguishing between fiqh, which is jurisprudence or the human understanding and Sharia, which is the divine way or the sacred path um, was an important contribution of feminist exegesis. Um, and the other thing was understanding that with this heavy concentration on Islamic law, legal constructs and the application, uh, there has been a tendency to uh, uh, support the notion uh, of women's, um, you know, subservience or subaltern relationship uh, because they were not the main subjects. So one of the ways in which we have challenged this is to really ask the fundamental question. Since there is a universal understanding that Islam is just and it's all about justice, 
can there be justice for Muslim women if they do not experience it? So women's subjectivity have to come to uh, the forefront. In fact, we live in a time where there's a critical mass. At no time in history were there as much agency demonstrated by women on behalf of women. Even in the time of the prophet, the radical reforms that were made then were not ones made by the women themselves. There's more Quranic passages about the social justice of women than any other aspect of social justice. But this was a gift to them. This was not as a result of their own advocacy. But now we're in the midst of this advocacy and we will not be turned back. Um, I think understanding that we can use women themselves as a measurement for any calculations of justice has been one of the radical aspects of uh, challenging patriarchal reading uh, in such a way that uh, the context has priority over the text. Uh, and this has led to um, a number of radical reform movements that allow for us to accept our own authority with regard to um, our own experiences and to value those experiences as indications of the necessity for reform. Thank you very much.